So this is a uh, joint work that I did with great collaborators at Google, um, Itor, Ethan, Joshua, and Guy Garari. Um, the topic that I want to talk about today is um, kind of has two different maybe components to it. Um, one is uh, to kind of take more of a scientific view towards deep learning and kind of understand well, we have this you know, large class of space of models that we're dealing with, large space of hyperparameters that we choose. Can we be a bit more concrete or be able to say something about um, different sorts of regimes, like dis distinguishing different sorts of regimes depending on our choice of hyperparameters? And the hyperparameter that we're gonna focus on in this talk is really, uh, it's, is learning rate um, in gradient descent or, or in stochastic gradient descent. I won't really distinguish between those two. So um, one kind of takeaway I hope uh, to kind of give from this talk is that um, uh, this sort of kind of analysis is maybe helps, it helps inform how to choose hyperparameters and figuring out what neural networks are doing in very different hyperparameter regimes. There's maybe a second aspect to it, which is that a lot of, um, uh, it, I hope to give you maybe a, a taste of some of the um, kind of scientific progress that's been made at kind of like a basic research level in deep learning recently. And a lot of that has been surrounding neural networks that um, are very overparametrized. So we, as you probably heard in the GPT-3 talk, um, we keep making neural networks uh, bigger and bigger and we continue to get performance gains from them. And so, um, you know, a lot of the theoretical, that led uh, people to kind of think a lot about um, what would happen if you took uh, kind of limiting cases of extremely large neural networks, say neural networks that were infinitely wide. Um, and uh, when I talk about width, I mean that imagine you have some deep neural network, it has a fixed depth to it, um, but each of the hidden layers has a certain number of hidden nodes in a fully connected network or um, in a convolutional network, this could be the number of channels. And we, we just take that number to be infinite. Um, it turns out that you can say a lot of theoretical things about this particular limit, and that's that's a lot of the a lot of the focus in recent and kind of the past two years has been on studying such networks. Um, there's kind of very cool connections between such networks, um, kernel uh, Gaussian processes, and kernel methods. And kernel methods in neural networks seem like very two different. Um, uh, approaches to machine learning and it's interesting that there's a connection between them when you uh, kind of think about the dynamics of neural networks in a particular regime. So I hope to give you kind of a taste of that um, in this talk uh, and I hope this is not too technical um, but please jump in with questions uh, uh, during it if, if something is unclear. So kind of the setting for this talk is we want to think about gradient descent in networks that are very wide as a function of the learning rate that we choose. And let's think about like constant learning rate SGD, but uh, oftentimes, um, and, and all of these experiments that I'll show, we also uh, can decay the learning rate. So really I wanna talk about how does the initial choice of learning rate kind of determine what kind of dynamics you get. Um, the results I wanna show you are very particular to uh, mean squared error, so just quadratic loss. Um, in practice, uh, a lot of people train with cross entropy. There's kind of a back and forth now about can we get MSC models to, to perform as well with, um, as cross entropy models, and um, I think that's an interesting kind of question by itself. This talk is focused on MSC, but uh, we're currently extending it to other loss functions. And um, kind of what I want to say as a summary of what's known theoretically about how what happens with deep neural networks when they're infinitely wide. So it turns out that, as I mentioned, uh, if you do gradient descent in an infinitely wide neural network, you're essentially just doing kernel regression. Um, so kernel kind of is like a similarity map um, uh, using features that are already fixed chosen by you. They're not kind of learned from the data. Um, and, and so in this limit, there are very interesting results that I've referenced here that tell us that neural networks just behave like a kernel method with a very particular choice of kernel. Um, there's another way of looking at it, which is that in that limit, um, neural networks behave uh, 
like some sort of linear model. Like the thing that you train is just linear in the parameters. Um, and this particular linear model is really just a first order Taylor expansion of the neural network about its initialization. So, you know, when you think of um, kind of back to uh, like Taylor series in, in math, um, imagine that you took your neural network function and some function f of x, it depends on the parameters theta, and you just expanded it about, its, about your initial point. Um, you expanded this function about uh, its initial point. So you get kind of a first order term, second order term, and so on. It turns out that all those other terms don't matter. Um, and uh, the neural network just behaves as if you had kept that first, uh, first order linear term, linear in parameters. But what we're trying to emphasize in this paper is that this kind of relationship only holds at smaller learning rates. And in practice, if you go and train a network that's of finite width, it's not infinitely wide, uh, you can train at much larger learning rates. And so there's a sharp distinction between what happens at small learning rates and large learning rates that I want to talk about. Um, so very briefly, I hope this isn't uh, too much math in one, in one slide, but I want to, there's going to be an object that I'm going to refer to uh, throughout this talk, which I kind of referenced before. It's a particular kernel, the neural, what I call the, what I'm going to refer to as the neural tangent kernel. And uh, I kind of want to give a sense of why it just comes about at all. Um, so the reason it comes about, uh, which was kind of made up evident in this earlier work that I mentioned, is that um, if you, you know, we always think about when we train neural networks, we deal with actual parameters of the neural network. So we run gradient descent, we update the parameters, but we don't really think about how is the function evolving during the course of training. Um, it turns out that if you try to write down the evolution equation for the function that the neural network is learning during training, it's very easy. You just um, use a uh, chain rule, um, some calculus, You'll, you can get this expression that I've shown here for MSC loss. Um, and so there's, very, there's this very special object that's appearing here that, is, that I refer to as theta. Um, in this box equation, this tells you how to compute it. Um, theta is this neural tangent kernel. Um, it's a particular kind of kernel that you get from the neural network by taking the gradients of um, the function that the neural network represents uh, with respect to the parameters and taking this inner product between these two gradients for two different points, x and x prime, uh, taking that dot product that gives you one entry of this kernel. Um, and so I only touch on this because this is kind of a core part of how we're gonna, it, it works into the theory and it's how we're gonna distinguish between what's a small learning rate and what's a large learning rate. But this is something that you could easily compute when you have access to the network gradients. So the question here is now, imagine you took uh, the, the model that you have and you trained it at different learning rates. What kind of phenomena would you observe? Well, you're in practice, you, um, as, uh, you probably have a lot of experience with this. If you choose a learning rate too large, um, a training will diverge. And that's because you're just taking like, um, the, the validity of your gradient descent is, is, uh, does not hold for step sizes that are too big. Um, you, you don't really match the curvature and really the kind of geometry of the lost landscape. Um, and so that's something that we know. But can we come up with a distinction between small and large that's also, uh, that's meaningful? And it turns out that we can and it's related to this theory of infinitely wide networks. And the way we're gonna do that um, is using uh, a special quantity that I'm going to refer to for the rest of the talk, which is called lambda naught. It's basically just the top eigenvalue of some matrix. The way you construct this matrix is from this object that I mentioned on the previous slide. So you can evaluate basically this similarity matrix uh, for every pair of um, points in your data set. And um, although, you know, maybe you're dealing, you know, maybe your data set is quite large, it's like 50,000 points, but you don't actually have to evaluate it on all those points. You can just take, evaluate it on a small batch of data. So in our experiments, this can be just 100 points to get an estimate of what this eigenvalue is. So construct this matrix 
which has elements theta sub a b on your batch of on your um, batch of 100 tr training points compute the top eigenvalue and we're going to use this quantity to tell us whether something is small or large and again this ties into all of the theory that's kind of been been built around infinite width networks so um, once you have this number lambda naught that i told you uh, is pretty cheap to compute. You just need um, some gradients. You evaluate it at initialization. So you just take your random na network, compute these gradients um, from the previous slide, evaluate it on say your 100 data points, so it's a 100 by 100 matrix, diagonalize it, get the top eigenvalue. Um, two over lambda naught is gonna be a special learning rate that tells us, that distinguishes two regimes, which uh, I'm going to refer to as lazy and catapult. The lazy uh, regime is something that's been studied before. It's basically the regime that I mentioned when you make the network wider and wider would give you this kind of kernel regression type um, learning that, uh, that people know about. Um, but what's new and, uh, and what we study in our paper is this other regime that we um, named the catapult phase um, because of the sort of picture, the thing that sort of happens qualitatively is that the learning rate is too large for the sort of basin uh, in the optimization landscape that you're initially sitting in. And so when the learning rate is just is too large, you know, you migrate out of that basin very rapidly at the beginning of training and you end up in some other basin. So it kind of allows you uh, to explore a very different part of the optimization landscape than you otherwise would have if you had trained with a small learning rate and stayed very close to your initialization. Um, another thing we point out in the paper is that if you uh, wanted to know what the max learning rate is, well, empirically, we found that it tends to have this simple form of C over lambda naught. So lambda naught you've already computed. C um, is a number that in some networks was four for us, and in other networks was 12. Um, in our theory, C is exactly four. So that's all to say that if you measure lambda naught, you would know what two over lambda naught is, what C over lambda naught is, um, and it would tell you kind of uh, these three different regimes. When am I gonna diverge? When will I get catapult behavior? When am I, will I get a lazy phase? Um, yes, man. it looks like we have a question from Mike Trainer. Uh, they're asking, is lambda not calculated using the initial parameter values before any gradient steps have been taken? Does it matter? How much does it change? That's a great question. So um, uh, it's, it's computed at initialization. Um, this, num this, you know, even though we'll be talking about, um, you know, the this is, it's a fantastic question because the catapult regime is a regime in which this number will change quite a bit. Um, but nonetheless, these kind of demarcations have to do, are, are just taken out initialization. They have to do kind of with the infinite width theory. Yeah. And all of the things that I'm saying are kind of, you should take it with a little bit of grain of salt. So they're like, um, uh, you know, the difference between running SGD, uh, versus full batch gradient descent, what kind of batch size, all of these effects that I'm going to show you, we kind of tested over all these different hyperparameter choices. So we think they're pretty robust. Um, I should say that we're dealing with networks that are pretty wide. So, um, I mean, in practice, they don't have to be that wide. They can be, you know, um, maybe hundreds of hidden units wide. Um, in general, I would advocate if you can make your network wider, you should try it. Um, because uh, that tends to not hurt performance uh, most of the time. But the sort of distinction that I'm talking about is one in which if you don't see a sharp distinction, you should just make your network wider and you will see it um, because it's really coming from infinite width or large width analysis. But um, so let's go to what are some of the signatures of these two phases? Like what's, what is different about these two? So one of, one of the things that's different is that if you looked at, um, how your training or your test loss evolves um, in these two different regimes, lazy versus catapult. So let's say you choose a learning rate that's smaller than eta crit and one that's falling in this other regime between eta crit and eta max. Um, in the catapult phase, you would find that your loss actually grows very early on in training. 
as if it's about to diverge, but it won't actually diverge, it'll come back down. Um, whereas in the lazy phase, you see kind of a smooth decrease uh, in the loss. Um, and so that's shown here kind of these green and red curves are basically eta values, learning rate values that put you in the catapult phase and the blue and orange curves uh, put you in the lazy phase. And the model on the left is sort of toyish. It's just three hidden layers trained on MNIST, but you see that the same thing holds up for a wide ResNet on CIFAR 10, um, which, which is a very different setting, um, but you kind of see the same phenomenon. Um, the other thing that you'll, that is kind of a signature of, of the distinction between these two is that if you actually looked at the evolution of lambda, which is effectively like a measure, a rough measure of the curvature of the basin that you're kind of currently in, uh, you would see two very different chart, like very different behaviors. So again, the green and red curves show an eta value that puts you in the catapult phase, the blue and orange curves are in the lazy phase, and what you see is that the curvature drops uh, pretty rapidly um, early in training um, if you're in the catapult phase, whereas uh, you just see it kind of decay a little bit if you're in the lazy phase. And it turns out as you make it wider and wider, actually in the lazy phase, your curvature won't drop at all because you're going to actually stay in the initial basin. This is sort of the existing theoretical result that we know. but um, but if your learning rate is above this value, you will evolve into another basin, your curvature which will change. And again, you see kind of similar phenomenology in, in a wide ResNet, despite the fact that that has um, more bells and whistles than a fully connected network. And, um, and here, a uh, final signature that I wanna mention is you kind of see that this persists throughout training. So even if you looked at the curvature, say at some at a certain time or at the end of training, you'd find that in the catapult phase, so this is showing you know, lambda as a function of the learning rate. In general, the curvatures in the catapult phase are much smaller than they are in the lazy phase. Um, now this particular plot, you can kind of see uh, what we found was particular to networks with ReLU, which we don't quite, um, haven't quite understood why it's different, but um, in networks with ReLU nonlinearities, so there's the two over lambda naught that I mentioned uh, at the very beginning, which is universal across all models for uh, being the value of eta critical. Um, eta max, which is this black uh, kind of vertical line here for these models occurs at 12 over lambda naught instead of four. So what that constant is kind of, again, there seems to be two rough cases that we see between ReLU models and non-ReLU models, but um, for lambda naught, then somewhere between you know two and twelve ish over lambda naught gives you the catapult phase learning rates that are smaller give you the lazy phase and you you start to diverge if your learning rate is um, larger than that. So um, if I'm doing okay on time, I just want to mention maybe two um, kind of things that you may not have heard about, um, but I think are uh, for people who train neural networks uh, all the time, it's uh, important to try out and maybe. Um, uh, yeah, just a good thing to note, which is that there are two different ways, um, actually, well, there are many different ways you can parameterize a neural network, and the one that you're often used to um, in, in that kind of exists is what I'm going to refer to as standard parameterization. So it has to do with the fact that when you choose um, to initialize your parameters, you usually have some units of um, size of the neural network hidden in there. So for instance, you might choose your, the weights of your neural network to be drawn from a normal distribution, but you'll scale the variance appropriately. So in this case, uh, the width of the, of the um, hidden layer that's, that's coming in is n, and you scale the variance as 1 over n. So that's kind of crucial um, for, for training. Like um, I think it's pretty widespread also, but it's crucial as you kind of change the size of your uh, hidden layer or make models deeper and so on that these factors kind of come in in the right places because you want to make sure that um, you're not losing signal or not not amplifying or diminishing signal as you kind of uh, propagate um, a signal through a neural network at it when at initialization so when you first begin to optimize um, so in the standard case what we usually do is we push those dimensions into the initialization of the parameters 
And then we'll just multiply the weights into whatever came from the previous layer to, to give us the new layer, to give us the new function. So from F to the L minus one to, to F to the L. Um, I wanna point out that another thing you could have done, which was done in this, one of the papers that I referenced earlier is um, to pull out the dimensions explicitly um, in, the, uh, in the parameter. So just write your neural network as parameterized as one over root n times the weights. And now the weights are gonna be initialized uh, as being drawn from a normal distribution with a variance that doesn't change with size. So it's just a constant here. Sigma squared w is an order one constant. And at initialization, these two are similar. Uh, they lead to slightly different gradient descent dynamics. But the nice, one, uh, nice thing about NTK parameterization is that it's kind of more resilient to um, changes in model size. So uh, a lot of the things that I talked about right now, um, uh, I, some of the equations I showed were done in this particular NTK parameterization, um, which you know, in practice, what it would mean is if you worked in this parameterization, what you would find is that your learning rates, your maximum learning rate or your critical learning rate, as you made the network wider or as you changed its size would stay about the same in, in value. It stays an order one constant. Um, in standard parameterization, what happens is the learning rate actually tends to vanish with width. So if you're kind of scanning over different this is relevant if uh, width is a hyperparameter for you um, in your experiments, because if you're comparing different um, models of different widths of different sizes, but you're sweeping over the same learning rate range and you're working in standard parameterization, uh, you won't, you're not testing kind of equivalent uh, models or an equivalent range. So that's maybe just kind of a side note. You can read more about it in this paper um, and elsewhere uh, in, kind of in our paper too. All of the results that I'm going to show are basically robust to whatever parameterization you choose. So actually the experiments we did are done in standard parameterization, but it's just something to be aware of uh, about how the maximum learning rate or how, how any learning rate in gen general scales with width, um, depending on how you've chosen this parameterization. And this is just kind of not really discussing why that happens, but just hinting, kind of giving you, um, touching on the fact that it does happen and it's something to maybe be aware of. Um, so I suspect I might be low on time. Um, and if that's the case, I might jump to the end. Uh, yeah, I think it'd be a good idea to jump to the end so we have time for questions. Okay, so I won't go over the kind of one of the heart of the paper, which is that we kind of not only observe these things empirically, but we can um, explain them theoretically with a very simple, elegant model that comes from a single hidden layer neural network. Um, I won't talk about it. For people who are interested in um, dynamical systems, um, I'll just say as a teaser that uh, you can basically just analyze these uh, two coupled um, uh, update equations, discrete update equations for two variables, f and lambda, they're just two scalars, and you can recover the existence of these two phases. And so here are the numerics that come from just the analysis of this two variable kind of dynamical system um, that you see is kind of uh, pretty close to the, the empirical results I showed you for like wide ResNet and other models. Um, where again, uh, there's, you know, eta critical is computed um, in a particular way and eta max um, uh, also has the form C over lambda naught where C is exactly four in this particular theoretical model. Um, so this is kind of the final slide. It's, um, we did a lot of experiments trying to understand um, if there was a connection between large learning rates and generalization because that's certainly a thing that, um, has, you know, people have, have mentioned in the past, um, you know, do um, connections between flatter minima and generalization. So one of the things we can say kind of in this paper is, well, of course, larger learning rates lead you to lower values of final curvature and therefore flatter minima in a certain sense. Um, across a lot of the experiments that we looked at, um, it tended to be the case that larger learning rates mainly, uh, meaning in this phase, in the catapult phase, 
that I uh, mentioned uh, did better, or that is to say that like the best performing model was often in the catapult phase. But I don't want to give kind of a universal statement about that because, again, it may depend on your problem where the optimal kind of learning rate lies. I think for a lot of problems in deep learning that people work on, particularly like image classification and things like that, um, it may be the case that uh, optimal learning rate kind of lies in this other regime. There, I didn't really talk about this, but um, there's kind of this ongoing debate now and, and investigation and research as to um, uh, what's actually happening in, what does feature learning actually consist of when we talk about that in kind of neural network models? And this catapult phase, another way to frame it is that it's one where we think there's a lot of feature learning. Um, this object that I referred to earlier, this kernel, has to do with the features that are being learned. And so if it's changing by a great amount, then you're learning a lot of features. Whereas in the lazy phase that I mentioned, um, we know that in the infinite width limit, you don't do any feature learning. You just have fixed kernel regression. Using a kernel, you evaluated at initialization. So there's um, kind of, that's an ongoing kind of topic of investigation, but here are just three plots that kind of show three different experiments. Starting from on the left, a very simple system on just a small number of samples where you see a huge gain um, in the test performance. Um, because there aren't that many samples. And then um, in the middle and rightmost plots, you just see wide ResNet models on CIFAR 10 and CIFAR 100, where the better performing models seem to fall in the catapult phase, uh, roughly. Um, these are also experiments where we did learning rate decay. So again, um, I don't know that there's like a universal statement that I want to say, but uh, it tends to be the case across our observations that when the model, if you make the model wider and wider, it gets better. And in general, between a small and large learning rate kind of phase, large learning rate tends to be, tends to be better. Um, so I'll, I'll end there. I'll maybe just point you to the paper if you want to read more. Um, and also um, for actually um, computing this eigenvalue. I think the Neural Tangents Library um, is a very useful library from um, collaborators of mine at Google. Um, and it can help with actually measuring, constructing this um, NTK kernel on a batch of data, measuring the eigenvalue. And so you can use it in um, experiments to kind of determine how to, how to choose learning rates and how to more generally tune hyperparameters. Great. Um, thanks, Yasman. That was a really, uh, really interesting talk. Uh, it, it highlighted some of the features of your work that I didn't really get from uh, just reading the paper, which is great. One of those that I wanted to uh, check in on is you, um, the batch norm is known to reduce the like biggest eigenvalue of the loss Hessian, which says that like the loss service gets a little bit less curvy. And this is thought to be what, like maybe the way that batch norm sort of gives you the ability to give higher learning rates. Would you expect that to also reduce lambda zero of this tangent kernel uh, matrix? And if so, does like do you think that your work ex like helps explain a little bit of the utility of batch norm? So um, that's a good question. I don't think our work does at the moment. Um, maybe that's the direction it could be taken in. What I didn't mention, and what, um, because it, uh, I probably needed more time to explain it in detail, is that actually this lambda naught is very closely related to the top eigenvalue of the Hessian, if you're using MSE law. So actually they're exactly the same in an infinitely wide model, and the difference comes about as you back off of infinite width. And so at finite width, there's kind of like a small correction term, which in our experiments, we actually, um, for a lot of the things that I showed, I don't want to say necessarily all, um, we also measured the Hessian um, eigen, like top eigenvalue to, to like study that discrepancy. And they're kind of more or less um, the same for, for uh, models of this size. But I would expect basically that because, uh, as, as you noted, um, batch room reduces that top eigenvalue, then lambda naught here in a batch room network would also be smaller. Um, what I think that, although there's no batch room in our theory, I think that this difference between small and large learning rate, though nonetheless 
seems to persist even with batch norm models because they are some of the models that we tested, but we don't really understand why. This, the theory is just a very minimal model. For sure. Um, great question from Tom Bishop through Zoom. So how do these investigations relate to empirical uses of like warm up and one cycle learning rate policies that should be very effective in practice? In practice? So just for folks listening, it's actually very common not to just use a single learning rate scalar value, but to actually cause that value to go up and down throughout training like a sawtooth pattern. So do you think that that connects to this, um, uh, the presence of these different phases in learning rates? So that's a great question also, and not one that um, we understand, or at least I understand. I, again, this, this work doesn't um, tell us about that. As far as I know, also, um, from talking to practitioners, I get the sense that warm-up maybe depends, the, um, the effectiveness of warm-up depend, depends a bit on the model, um, as far as I have heard. Um, so that's something that I would kind of want to look into in understanding this. But at the moment, um, I don't have a good understanding of what happens, how to, how to do the warm up, um, how long to have it go for, what max learning rate to achieve. Um, the context of this paper was, I mean, one could make some guesses maybe based off of this paper, but I don't, I don't know that we'd want to do that. But for this paper, um, Another way to interpret it is not just constant learning rate um, SGD, but just the choice of the initial learning rate. And then you could decay even to the same value later on or so on. But it's, it's that initial choice that kind of um, uh, determines the, yeah, determines um, this distinction that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. um, all right, I, I think uh, we only have time for one last question. Uh, so, you mentioned that for overparameterized networks, they effectively behave as though they were linear in the parameters. Uh, and so you're, you know, you're sort of staying close by and just doing this first order Taylor expansion. So famously, I think in some of the work that you and I have both done on, on when neural networks optimize and when they don't, uh, the, uh, some of the most prominent work recently has been about these very overparameterized networks and proving that they are actually locally like convex, that they don't go very far and that they opt and that if they don't go very far, then you can prove that gradient descent converges. So is that, do you, are those two phenomena related? Is it, is it the case that those proofs like from Alan Zhu at Microsoft uh, and similar, that those only hold in the lazy regime and not like the catapult regime? So that's um, a great question. Um, so one, I guess there are, um, Actually, so I'm not, I'm not quite sure of those other papers, whether they're, I suspect that they're studying some properties of the local geometry and not global geometry, because this is really now a statement about the global geometry, the, the fact that there exists other basins that are sort of far. Um, the older results that, there were a series of results that were leading basically, I think some of the ones that you, you were referring to, um, that told us overparameterized models behave like just are, are um, effectively like convex optimization is, is what's relevant here. And this is, this neural tangent kernel result is um, kind of, uh, is consistent with that. So it's maybe a slightly different result or made flavor of result because it's not talking, maybe the way I see it is, it's not talking about um, the, like the geometry in a neighborhood, like, um, maybe like actually studying, like let's say you define um, a neighborhood you want to study and then study all the critical points in that neighborhood, but sort of talking about um, the effective landscape that a neural network sees as a result of our choice of initialization um, is effectively a convex landscape. That's kind of the way I understood that distinction. But I think you're right that um, uh, there is some something to be done in in between here. The catapult result kind of suggests um, that uh, uh, that there are other basins. I should say that there's maybe a, there are subtleties here that I didn't mention. So this kind of result um, is very relevant for finite width networks because of the way the time scale. So I showed you results that show that this kind of increase in loss happens very early in training. Um, we, out of this effective model, we can get at time scale for how this 
how fast this happens. And it grows logarithmically with the width. Um, so it's actually a diverging time scale as you make models wider and wider. Um, in practice, we never observed that it was, or we saw that it would scale, but it scales so weakly that it's like a, it, you know, this catapult happens within the first few steps or first kind of 50 steps or so of gradient descent. Um, but to make a statement about infinite width networks, I think, uh, you know, this basin that we're talking about, strictly speaking at infinite width, also takes like infinite time to get to. So um, I think it would be kind of tricky. I don't know how to tie those two together, like uh, right now, I think, but those, mm -hmm. um, yeah. I do think for intensive purposes, like um, the optimization is effectively convex when you're infinitely wide, but like, mm -hmm in practice of the widths that we're talking about, this, this other time scale, logarithmic time scale is very small. And so mm -hmm. this other regime is relevant. So this work kind of points out in some ways that there's another way to take an infinite width limit, which is that you should also take time to be infinite. And that was not accessible to the previous kind of papers as far as I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting, it's an interesting thought. <laughs>